Hello Physiology 142 lab students. Welcome to your first online lab. This lab covers digestive anatomy and processes. So this lab is divided into three modules which are covered here in this video. Each module is about seven to eight minutes in length. The first module covers digestive macroanatomy and that refers to your lab manual pages 157 through 169. The second module covers digestive histology and that is covered in your histology manual on chapter 15 and the third module covers digestive processes, and this refers to your lab manual, page 169. So for each of these exercises, you should complete the accompanying worksheets, which I have sent you via email. In order to get points for coming to class, you need to upload these documents to your Dropbox by this time next week in order to get points. As always, if you have any questions or anything like that, you can drop me a line uh, at langston at hawaii.edu or send me a text at 808-429-6218. Okay, and the T-Rex here has said I've spoken long enough, so without any further ado, good luck on your monuments. Hello, in this module you're going to be learning about the macro anatomy of the digestive system. We're going to be looking principally at two different models and you should follow along in page 157 and 158 of your lab manual. This is the anatomy to know for the digestive system. And this particular model right here comes from page 171, so it might be helpful if you label it as we go along. Okay, firstly, let's see what we can see in the head of the macroanatomy here. The first thing you see up here is, of course, the mouth, the oral cavity, and this right here is the pharynx, the nasopharynx, okay? And then down here, we're gonna have the oropharynx. Remember, the pharynx is the area where digestive and respiratory tracts potentially overlap. If we go over here, you can see this is your hard palate. It's made up of your palatine bones and your maxillary bones. And below that is your tongue. The tongue is an important digestive organ because it helps to force food back into the pharynx so it can be swallowed. As we go down here, remember there are two tubes. The back tube here is the esophagus. The front tube here is the larynx and the trachea. So air ideally should be going down the front tube, which is the larynx and trachea, and food should be going down the back tube. So who makes that decision for us? It's this little guy right here who's the epiglottis. So when we're breathing, the epiglottis remains open, allows air to pass into the larynx and into the trachea. When we're swallowing, as in eating, that little flap will close down and it will divert food back in here, back into the esophagus, where it will move towards the stomach. Okay, let's take a look at the macroanatomy of the lower part of the upper digestive tract. First of all, you have the stomach here, right? The stomach is an important food storage organ and the esophagus, which was up there, led to the stomach. This area of the stomach right here is called the cardiac area or cardiac sphincter. And a sphincter is a smooth muscle ring that constricts to only allow food go in one direction in most cases. Uh, sometimes when this sphincter uh, malfunctions, we actually have acid moving to the esophagus and we get that acid reflux. So again, cardiac sphincter up here. This area up here is called the fundus. The fundus is the round area of the stomach there. Okay, fundus is fun, and that's where we have food storage going on. Back down here, we have the body of the stomach. The body of the stomach is where we have most of the mechanical processing going on, the agitation. You can also see these grooves in here, which are called rugi, and rugi allow more surface area for the stomach, and they also enable the stomach to expand after large meals. Okay. Coming off the central part of the stomach, the main body of the stomach, is this curvature right here, which is called the greater curvature. So it's the great curve on the outside of the stomach, as opposed to the inside here is called the lesser curvature. Okay, each of these curvatures has an omentum or a fat flap that comes off there. You can't see it in this model, unfortunately. So that fat flap is what covers the intestines and everything else, and it makes your uncle and even your anatomy professor gives them that paunch as they get older. So guys tend to put in fat on their omentum. Okay. Going past there, we get into the pyloric region of the stomach, and this is the pyloric sphincter right here. So the pyloric sphincter is the junction between the stomach and the small intestine. And that's where food's gonna be moving through there at a very limited rate because the small intestine can only uh, take a little bit of food at one time. Okay, before we get to the small intestine, let's take a look at the liver and talk about macroanatomy of the liver. There's some terms that are on your sheet that we're not gonna go over because you can't see them uh, very well from the models that we have for you today. So the liver is right here. This is an important accessory organ of the GI tract or accessory organ of the digestive system. It doesn't actually handle food per se, but it does help to convert molecules that come from the GI tract. For example, if you eat too much carbs, it can convert that into fat and vice versa. 
Okay, so look what we have here for the liver. We have a left and right lobes. So this would be our, what, left lobe and our right lobe over here. Then we have something called the falciform ligament. The falciform ligament suspends the liver uh, from the body wall as well as the diaphragm. Okay, back down here, you can see this is the gallbladder. The gallbladder uh, stores and concentrates bile. It doesn't make bile. Bile is actually made in the liver and it's stored and concentrated here. Okay, and then it travels by something called a common bile duct and eventually reaches up here into our, uh, our duodenum, which is the first loop of the small intestine. There's other ducts that are on your list, for example, the cystic duct. But again, because we're doing distance anatomy, you're not really gonna see it. So we'll take those off the list here. Okay, another organ we should mention as far as accessory organs is up here, and that is the pancreas. The pancreas is an exocrine organ that secretes things like uh, our lipase enzymes, a pancreatic lipase, and other enzymes that help to digest proteins, and we'll talk about those in the next module, uh, but it also secretes insulin and glucagon. So be able to identify the pancreas. You don't have to identify the ducts of OD or anything like that. Okay, now let's look at the rest of the small intestine. We already said that the first loop of the small intestine way up there was the duodenum. Well, that soon leads into the jejunum and eventually the ileum. Now, the duodenum is recognizable because it's the one very up top and it's only a few inches long. Jejunum is in here and then it transitions eventually to ileum. Just remember duodenum, jejunum, ileum, like Dow Jones Industrials, okay? Those three are the three parts of the small intestine. Okay, the small intestine then empties into the large intestine. Okay, so here we have the ileum. This is all ileum down here. And then it empties into the large intestine by something called the ileocecal valve. So this is the ileocecal valve, and this is the cecum. The cecum is the first part of the large intestine. Okay, and coming off the cecum, we have this structure right here, which is the appendix. The appendix is just a blind insect that we used to think had no function, but now we know it's important for uh, basically uh, immune surveillance of the digestive tract. It's also a repository of beneficial bacteria that can help repopulate the intestines. Okay, so let's go back up here and see what, what else we have. Okay, so the large intestine is named because it has a large diameter, but in fact, it's actually smaller in length than the, than the small intestine. Okay, so starting with the large intestine, we have three main loops that are visible here. We have going up the ascending, going across the de uh, transverse and going down the descending. So those are the three main loops of the large intestine that we can see here. There's also a sigmoid colon, which we can't see right now. But the important part about the large intestine is the main anatomy here is made up to these hostra or pouches. And every time food moves from one hostra to the other, it dries, dries out a little bit. We'll talk about that in the physiology module in just a little bit. Okay, but we go up to the colon here and we have two flexures. This flexure right here, if I can point there, okay, is what we call our hepatic flexure. Okay, that's because it's close to the liver. We go across our transverse colon again, and we get back here to our splenic flexure, okay, because it's close to the spleen. And then we have descending colon again. The principal function of the colon is to dry out the stool so that it's ready to be defecated. It also helps to absorb some vitamins that are uh, broken down or freed up by bacterial fermentation. And if we can go down a little bit more, we can see the rectum and the anus. Okay, the sigmoid colon is actually back behind here as an S-shaped thing. And then here we have the rectum in here and the anus right here. And there is an external and internal anal sphincters. The external anal sphincter is skeletal muscle. The internal anal sphincter is involuntary smooth muscle. Okay, now let's look at the uh, other model we have here, which is our human torso model. We're gonna be able to see some things on that that we can't see on the other digestive models. So let's take a look at what we can see here. So first of all, looking back up, we've got the mouth, the oral cavity right here. We've got the tongue, of course. The lips are out here. These are labia or lips. And then of course we have the hard palate up here, which is made of our palatine bones and our maxillary bones. And we actually have, you can see a tooth in there. Okay, the tooth is sitting in there. We have the crown of the tooth, which is the visible part, and the root of the tooth, which is embedded in the alveolar bone right there in the oral cavity. Um, the gingiva are just the pink things that are on the outside there. The gingiva are basically the gums that are surrounding the tooth, okay? And that tooth is a gumphosis. It's held in that socket by something called a periodontal ligament. You're not gonna be able to see that here. Okay, so, here we are in the oral cavity. We already pointed out the tongue. Uh, we pointed out the teeth, but now I want to point out these glands right here. These are salivary glands. And we have two that are visible here. This one under the tongue is called the sublingual gland. 
And then the one that's just over here is called the submandibular gland. Both of them secrete saliva. There's another gland called the parotid gland that would be right about here, but we can't see it in this model. Okay, let's review the other anatomy that we can see on the human torso model here. Okay, we've already talked about the respiratory anatomy a couple weeks ago. So up top, you can see the trachea. This is the heart. There's the lungs to the side. And then here is a very large organ called what? The liver. The liver is the largest internal organ in the body, and it's divided into four lobes. The lobes that you can see here are the left lobe, and the right lobe. And remember, it's divided down here. We have something called the falciform ligament, and then down below, something called the ligamentum teres. Uh, the falciform ligament, again, suspends us um, uh, below the diaphragm. And then if you can see right about here, oh, it's disappeared because of the green screen. That would be our gallbladder, and that's where we store and concentrate bile. Okay, what else can we see here? We can see a little bit of the stomach. And when the part of the stomach we can see is the greater curvature. So greater curvature right here, hanging off that would be the greater momentum, which you cannot see, but that's the fat flap. Okay, and that's pretty much all you can see in this model unless we pulled that stomach out. As far as the intestines, remember the first loop of the small intestine would have been the duodenum. We can't see that here, but here we can see the jejunum, and then eventually down here the ileum, and the ileum leads to the ileocecal valve and to the cecum, which is the first part of the large intestine. So the large intestine, again, has uh, three different visible loops here. So we have one going up ascending, transverse, and then descending coming back down, and back behind the small intestines would be our sigmoid colon. Okay, remember we have flexures here. We have our hepatic flexure, we have our splenic flexure, and those are the two flexures we can see right here. So that's pretty much all I'm holding you responsible for for this particular model. The other one has more information that you should know for quizzes and your exam. Okay, welcome back to our second module. This module is on the microanatomy of the digestive system. So by microanatomy, I mean the histology of the GI tract and the accessory organs. So we're going to start out with the GI tract here. This is part of the small intestine. And remember, the GI tract is a hollow tube that goes all the way from the back of your mouth uh, to your anus. And it's composed principally of four layers, three of which are visible here. And those include the mucosa, the submucosa, and the muscularis. The mucosa layer is made up primarily of uh, epithelial tissue. In some areas it can be simple, in some areas it can be stratified, but predominantly it's going to be simple columnar epithelium. The submucosa here is made up of uh, principally of lots and lots of connective tissue. There's lymphatic tissue there, there's blood vessels there, and a lot of nervous tissue as well. And finally the muscularis is, as the name implies, uh, muscular tissue. And for the most part, it's going to be smooth muscle unless we're talking about the back of the pharynx or uh, once we get down towards the rectum and the anus, there's a little bit of skeletal muscle in there as well. Okay, the serosa, which is the fourth layer here, is missing, but that would be a connective tissue layer which would surround the other three layers and unite them to the body wall. Here you can see something called the intestinal villus. A villus is a finger-like projection, and it helps to increase the surface area of the small intestine and other GI organs, and that helps for absorption as well as enzyme secretion. Now, underneath the villus, you can see the inside of the villus is a structure called the lamina propria. This is just a little bit of areolar connective tissue that we find within the mucosal layer. So here we can see a 400x view of the same type of histology we were looking at previously. So this again is the small intestine. And here you can see the villus. The villus is the big finger-like structure uh, on the left-hand side of the screen. We have another one on the right. And then you can see that each villus is made up of simple columnar epithelium. So most of the time we're going to have simple epithelium in the stomach, the small intestine, large intestine. The only exceptions are we're going to have stratified squamous epithelium and the esophagus and the lower part of the rectum and anus because we have friction going on there. Now within each villus we have uh, beneath the simple columnar epithelium, we have the lamina propria, which is areolar tissue and other connective tissue as well. And of course, what uh, mucosal epithelium would be complete without these wonderful goblet cells? And goblet cells secrete a mucin, which hydrates into become mucus. And remember, mucus is necessary in order to protect the GI layers, but also to keep things moving smoothly across the intestinal epithelium. 
Okay, let's look at our next gland, and this gland is some of the accessory glands of the GI tract, and that's going to be the salivary glands. So we have three salivary glands. We have a parotid, a sublingual, and a submandibular, and some of them secrete primarily mucus. Some of them secrete um, other stuff as well. This one's a mixed gland, and we're going to take a look at this. So we can see obvious ducts there where saliva and other stuff is secreted. Okay, and then here we can see these mucus cells. Mucus cells secrete mucin, which hydrates into mucus. And then we have something called serous demilunes. Now, demilun means half moon. So these are little half moon structures that secrete some of the more liquidy, um, watery uh, secretions of saliva. And those are secreted by your serous demilunes. If I ever have a dog, I think I'm going to name him serous demilune. Sounds very British. Okay, let's go on to the liver histology here and take a look at uh, what the liver looks like. The first thing you should notice is that it's divided into these hexagonal lobules. Okay, this is actually a, a very unusual type of histology. We've done a stain so you can see this connective tissue, this collagenous septa. A lot of times it's not that visible, but you can see that it divides the liver into these uh, hexagon lobules and that each lobule has a central vein, and the central vein uh, is important for the physiology, the functioning uh, of, of the liver lobule. And then it has that collagenous septum. And on the outside, it has something called the portal triad. The hepatic portal vein is in there, along with a bile duct, along with a hepatic artery. You can't see them all, but each corner should have a portal triad. Now, if we look at a higher magnification, this is around 400x, you can see these plates of hepatocytes. The liver is made up of hepatocytes, so anytime you hear the word HEPA is referring to the body, you want to think it meaning something to do with the liver, like hepatitis is inflammation liver. So here are these plates of hepatocytes, and their job is several fold. Uh, the hepatocytes uh, manufacture bile for the emulsification of lipids. Uh, they also help to biotransform, uh, let's say, uh, carbohydrates into fats and vice versa. They help to deaminate and uh, detoxify proteins as they are digested and metabolize. So the liver is a very, very important organ. Okay, let's go on to our last organ, which is the pancreas. The pancreas is part endocrine and part exocrine. So the first thing you should notice is it is also divided into lobes or lobules. Okay, if you look at the pancreas in macroanatomy, uh, like a lot of endocrine glands, it looks like chewed up chewing gum. And that's because of this lobular anatomy or structure. You can see in here, we do have some blood vessels in there, some that are very small, some that are very large. Down here is probably a vein or a venule or something like that. Now, if we look in a little bit greater detail, if we zoom in, let's say to 100x, we can start to see some of this uh, acinar tissue. tissue. So acinar tissue uh, is made up of acini, and these are structures that are basically sac-like glands that secrete the exocrine component of what the pancreas does. So the pancreas has endocrine and exocrine functions. It's primarily tissue is primarily 90% acinar tissue, and that's tissue that's making, uh, for example, enzymes that digest proteins, such as trypsin, enzymes that digest lipids, such as the lipase, and it also makes the bicarbonate. So 90% of the pancreas's sort of uh, real estate is devoted to that. Okay, here you can see a 400x view of the pancreas, and finally you should see something different. You see, obviously, the acinar tissue that secretes our enzymes, such as trypsin and also our bicarbonate. But then you see something called the islets of Langehans. And the islets of Langehans is this circular structure right here. And it is responsible for secreting insulin and glucagon. And if you remember back to the endocrine system, these were two hormones that helped to regulate blood sugar. Uh, insulin helps to lower blood sugar by bringing sugar into the cells, and glucagon helps to break down glycogen and free up more glucose for the bloodstream. Hello, this is Dr. Langston back at you with the third module of the Digestive Anatomy Lab, and this module is on digestive processes. If you're wondering about the lab coat, well, the reason is it's freaking freezing in here, and I have no other clothing in the building besides some student's lab coat. So whoever's this is, thanks. 
Okay, let's talk about some digestive processes. So turn on over to page 169 in your lab manual and there should be table 9.2, which talks about the processes and secretions of different digestive organs. So we're gonna talk about the secretions, but also the processes at the same time. So let's start out where digestion begins and that is in the mouth. So in the mouth, we have the tongue, we have the teeth, all that stuff going on. And so the mouth is there for mastication. Mastication sounds like a dirty word, but it ain't. Uh, it just means to chew. So we're chewing the food up, breaking it down into smaller parts, and as we do that, we provide more surface area for enzymes to act upon. As far as what else is being secreted in the mouth, as far as enzymes, well, we have a lot of saliva up there, and saliva contains a lot of water, some mucus, um, some uh, immunoglobulins probably, but more, most importantly, there is an enzyme in there called salivary amylase. And salivary amylase helps to break down large polysaccharides or starches into smaller monosaccharides so they can later be absorbed. Now, after the food has been chewed and swallowed, it's gonna move down from the pharynx down into the esophagus. And remember, in order for food not to go down the lungs, we actually have to close off our epiglottis. So the epiglottis diverts that food down to the esophagus, and that food is transmitted down there through a process called peristalsis. And basically, we have contraction of smooth muscle uh, in back of the food and relaxation in front of it. And that is basically a one-way ticket down into our stomach. Okay, so once the food is in the stomach, we then have stomach secretions. So what kind of secretions are made by the stomach? Well, there's a couple. First of all, there's hydrochloric acid, which is made by our uh, parietal cells. And the hydrochloric acid helps to reduce the pH down to about two. And it also denatures or unfolds the proteins so they're mo more easily digested. So that's one job of the hydrochloric acid. Another very important secretion is the enzyme called pepsin. Pepsin is secreted by our chief cells, and pepsin is responsible for breaking down large poly, uh, large proteins into uh, individual amino acids. And so that's the job of pepsin. So we begin protein digestion in the stomach. Now, as far as other secretions that are coming from other organs at this point, we need to talk a little bit about the liver. The liver is gonna manufacture bile, and bile is useful in emulsifying fats. Bile doesn't actually break down triglycerides into individual monoglycerides, but it does help to emulsify it or break it into smaller droplets. So that bile is produced in the liver, but is stored and concentrated right here in your gallbladder. Okay, next after that, we have the pancreas. And the pancreas is a very important endocrine and exocrine organ. It's important because it helps to produce a lot of different enzymes uh, that are used in digestion. And it also is important in producing the hormones insulin and glucagon. So the enzymes and secretions that are really important for the pancreas are first of all, bicarbonate. Bicarbonate uh, is basically baking soda. It helps to neutralize the pH uh, as the stomach contents pass into the duodenum right here. So this is the duodenum, okay? And once we're in the stomach, we have a pH of around two, but once we move in the duodenum, the small intestine, our pH shifts up to about five or six or so. And that's because of the bicarbonate secreted by the pancreas. The other secretion is something called trypsin. Trypsin is another protein digesting enzyme similar to pepsin. Why do we have to have two enzymes? Well, remember that pepsin worked well in the stomach where the pH is two, trypsin works well in the small intestine where the pH is around six. So they work better at certain pHs. Okay, so we had trypsin, we had bicarbonate. Uh, another important secretion of the pancreas would be the pancreatic lipase. And this breaks down lipids in the small intestine. So this is the first really effective lipase we've had so far. We had one in the mouth, but it really is not that effective. So pancreatic lipase is what helps to break down the fats along with the bile that you had that emulsified those fats. And all of this happens in the small intestine. Okay, now let's move on to the enzymes secreted in the small intestine. The small intestine has two functions. One is digestion. We have a lot of digestion going on there, but also absorption. This is where we actually absorb the majority of the nutrients that we get in our GI tract. So first of all, where are the enzymes for digestion coming from? A lot of them were coming from up there, up top from our pancreas. Remember that was our trypsin, that was the bicarbonate, that was the uh, chymotrypsin, uh, all the different enzymes, the lipase is secreted by the pancreas. In addition to those enzymes, the intestine itself has its own enzymes. Uh, one of those enzymes is something called sucrase that helps to break down sucrose, a disaccharide, into individual monosaccharides. 
We also have lactase, which breaks down milk sugar, uh, also a disaccharide, into individual monosaccharides. And we have other brush border enzymes. And the brush border enzymes are actually part of the apical parts of the cells there uh, inside the intestine. Okay, and the duodenum also secretes something called cholecystokinin, or CCK. CCK is something that helps to uh, control the rate of gastric emptying. When there's a lot of fatty food being moved from the stomach into the small intestine, that actually takes a while to break down and absorb. So the small intestine, the duodenum up here, will secrete um, our cholecystokinin, which will act on the stomach, and that will cause the stomach to slow its rate of gastric emptying. So that's an important function of CCK. Okay, now let's talk about the last part of the digestive system, which is the large intestine. We already pointed out the uh, anatomy of the large intestine in, in a previous module, but remember we have that ascending, transverse, and descending colon there. Unlike the small intestines, which had a digestive and an absorptive function, uh, the primary function of the large intestine is to absorb excess water uh, that's in the food and also to absorb any vitamins that are freed up by bacterial fermentation. We are not really secreting any enzymes of our own, so we're not doing any more digestion, and we're not really absorbing carbs or, or fats or anything like that. All of that really had to happen in the small intestine. So pretty much we're just concentrated on water and a few vitamins. So food starts out in these hosta right here, and as it's forced from one hosta to the next, uh, it will dry out for a little while. And what happens is we have this gradual, what we call hostral churning, where food goes bloop, and then bloop, and then bloop, up from one chop, hoster to the next, until it gets about midway across the transverse colon. At that point, a new process begins called mass peristalsis. And mass peristalsis is violent, it is uh, involuntary, and it's this sudden movement of food or stool um, from the transverse colon all the way down to the rectum. And it basically goes like Okay, and that feeling and sound that you have associated with is called borborygmus, and that's because we have this violent contraction of smooth muscle, forcing stool and gas and all this stuff back down to the rectum here. And then we have a internal anal sphincter, which is smooth muscle, but that just opens right up as soon as the defecation reflex begins. The only thing between you and calamity is this external anal sphincter, which is made up of skeletal muscle. So this is what keeps you from pooping your pants. Thank God for the external anal sphincter.